was a prophet. He got messages from God and delivered them to people. God will restore our land. Everything was fine until God gave him this message. Dear Nineveh, in 40 days you will be destroyed. Jonah didn't like the message, and he really didn't like Nineveh. He ran in the opposite direction of Nineveh, and he didn't stop at the sea. He kept going on this boat with these guys until they realized that Jonah was the cause of this horrible storm that tossed their ship, and they tossed him overboard. That's when Jonah met the very big fish. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah. It's in the Old Testament. If you open up and you're at Psalms, go right. If you open up and you're somewhere in Malachi, Matthew, go left, and you'll eventually run into it there. Uh, this is one of the most fascinating books in all the Bible. This book contains so many amazing truths and lessons for us. If we approach it from the aspect when we were kids and we think about just Jonah the well, we'll miss so many amazing truths. But what we find in this book is a man on the run. That's the reason we've entitled this series, Man on the Run. In chapter 1, he ran from God. Chapter 2, he ran back to God. And now today, we're going to watch Jonah run with God. And we see him uh, participate and be a part of some amazing things. In fact, he's a part of the greatest miracle, and ministry miracle in the history of man. And we'll look at that in just a second. This is a quick recap. Let's kind of back up and run through what's happened. In, in chapter 1, God came to Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, a man of God, a spokesman of God. He had a tremendous reputation and respect. He calls upon Jonah and he says, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. Now, don't miss this because this may be the first time that we see God send a prophet to a Gentile nation. See, he was a contemporary of Amos and Hosea, and God sent them to talk to the Israelites who were out of sort. They were in captivity to try to bring them to repentance. And yet, at the same time, God sends Jonah to the Assyrians. I think there's a powerful message there, that God loves the world. Whether you are a Christian or not Christian, whether you're an Israelite or not Israelite, God's love is for all the world. The reason God says, for God's love, the world that he gave his only begotten son. The gospel, the truth of God, the message of God is not just for a chosen few. It's for anyone who would believe in him. And so God gives an invitation. He gives the opportunity by calling Jonah to go. The problem is Jonah didn't want to go. I'm sure if God had said, Jonah, I tell you what, I'm going to send Amos or Hosea and you go to the Israelites and I'll send one of them. He'd have been, oh, yeah, I'll do that. But instead he decides to take off in the opposite direction. And we find that in this passage that he is well on his way when God sends a storm, and this storm literally turns everything upside down. The sailors are, are so fearful, they begin praying out to their gods. They begin throwing cargo overboard. It got so bad, they started casting lots. Can you imagine being tossed around and you're trying to cast lots? Who's responsible for this? And sure enough, it falls upon Jonah. If they had thrown lots a thousand times, a thousand times it would have fallen on Jonah. And so Jonah stands up and says, okay, it's me. God told me to go to Nineveh, and I ran. And they're like, well, what do we do now? They wanted to rescue him, but he says, listen, here's what you need to do. You need to throw me over the board, and I'll just die, and I'll face God in eternity. I won't worry about facing him in this life. It's kind of like students that you got this big, huge test, and you're so terrified you're not going to flunk it. You go, God, would you just send the rapture to us so I don't have to take this test? That's kind of what Jonah's basically saying. God, I'll just die. I'll face you into eternity. But instead of getting into eternity and dying, he finds himself in the belly of a big fish, swimming in acid, wrapped in seaweed. And we know that from that, he finally kind of comes around and says, okay, God, I'm going to relent. He maybe even repented, but he says, God, I'm willing to do what you've asked me to do. And that's kind of where we pick up the story in chapter 3. So chapter 3, verse 1, why don't you follow along with me? Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Very significant phrase, the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord. If you have your pen, pencil, 
lipstick mascara, underline that phrase, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Here's another huge line worth circling. The Ninevites believed God. They believed God. And a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warnings reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocked, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Notice, it wasn't little g God. It wasn't the God, the, the fish God that they worshipped. It was Jehovah. It was Elohim. It was the God of Jonah. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. And then when God saw what they did, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them destruction that he had threatened. Jonah 3 is the high point in this book. In this remarkable story, this is the apex. This is where it happens. The greatest ministry miracle in all of history occurs right here in this text. See, there were over 400, in fact, estimated that probably 480,000 adults that quick, put their faith in God, repented. Uh, that in itself is a significant miracle. He preached eight words, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. An entire city repented. But before we can get to that, we need to understand this sermon first required a second chance. It required a second chance. Now, typically, we don't like second, do we? What is second place? It's first loser. <laughs> Nobody likes second. How many of you like when you, when you get a phone call and someone says, hey, hold on a second? Who wants to hold on? None of us. Do you think Olympic athletes, they train for four years so that they can come in second? I don't think so. We don't like second. But there was ever time to like second, it's right here. And that is a second chance. Husbands, how many of you appreciate the fact that even though you're perfect in so many ways, that your wife has given you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance? I mean, there's some of you, number 389 chance, you know what I'm saying? We love a second chance. I, I personally need it have it embossed on my forehead. Second chances welcomed. I'm so thankful for this because we see in this passage that not only does Jonah get a second chance, but Nineveh gets a second chance. Nineveh, a man of God and the pagans of God, both get a second chance. So let's pick up. We'll start in verse 1, and we're going to go through four, four points that I think are important for us to understand and grasp, and several lessons in the midst of this. The first thing I want you to see is that God graciously repeats his call. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Now, the first thing you need to see here is that when you're ready to quit running from God, God's ready to give you a second chance. God's ready to start using your life. Now, this is important because every one of us, there's a little Jonah in everyone. There's a little bit of rebellion. There's a little bit of humanity that causes us to go in the opposite direction. It's like, the, like Isaiah wrote, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way. We're all capable of doing something that's opposite of the will and the heart of God. And see, in this particular case, we know that Jonah was a man of God, a prophet of God, a spokesman of God. He was a man that God had used in powerful ways in the past. And yet some, somehow, some way, whether it was because of fear, whether it was because he didn't like the message, whether it was because he wanted to go to Israel instead of to the Gentiles, what we know is that he fell off the tracks. 
he went in the opposite direction. And he found himself in a storm, in stomach, all because he refused to go the direction God called him to go. Now, before we get too harsh on Jonah, let's remember David did it. The apostle Peter did it. Abraham did it. Moses did it. Jacob did it. In some ways, Rahab probably did it. And if you start looking at men and women who are in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, not one of them was perfect. And at some point in time, they unplugged. Maybe they went on a spiritual vacation. I, we don't know what happened, but they did not do what God asked them to do. And they found themselves in a very precarious situation. Here's the point. God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He expects us to be obedient. He desires obedience. These men and women, they weren't pagans, they were human. They were fallible. They made mistakes. Now, this doesn't give them an excuse to live by the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, or the pride of life. See, an amazing thing happens when we come to faith in God. And that is, he gives us a new identity. Colossians says he rescues us, he colonizes us, he makes us citizens. We become saints of God. Our identity is secure in Christ. We are under grace. The problem is, is that even though our, our, we're being crucified with Christ, our mind still needs to be remo renewed, according to Romans 12. And our flesh still needs to be beaten because it still wants to go after the things of this world. And so there's a war going on. The flesh sets its desires against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, so that you don't do the things that you, can, that you want to do. And every one of us, whether you're a Jonah or whether you're like the Apostle Peter, every single person, until the day that Christ redeems us, until the day that you meet him into eternity, we have this war going on inside of us of whether or not we're going to be obedient to the call of God on our lives. In this particular case, we know that Jonah blew it. Can I give you an amazing verse for Christians? 1 John 1.9. 1 John is a book written to Christians to authenticate genuine faith and to teach us that when we operate according to the patterns of the flesh, that if we, could, we do these things, it'll restore intimacy of fellowship with God. Not our salvation, our salvation is secure. Simply this verse. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God will restore intimacy. He'll restore the call. And so what we see is that he comes back. And I love this point. No matter what you've done, no matter how far you feel you've disobeyed God, no matter how bad you think you are and how God may or may not ever be able to forgive you or release you, if you're willing to relent, if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to turn to God, trust him and say, God, I will be obedient to whatever you call me to do, God will give you another opportunity. God will use your life for his good, for, for your good, his glory. And that is, a, that is an important thing. I can't begin to tell you how many people I've come across who've said, you know what, I did this. There's no way God will ever be able to use me again. That is a lie from the pit of hell. If you're willing to repent and if you're willing to obey, God can use you and use your life for amazing, eternal, and earthly purposes. But the key is repenting and getting right with God and obeying. We pick up with Jonah, verse 3. God graciously repeats his call. Jonah, this time, obediently responds. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. See, after a storm, a stomach, and a spew, we have take two. 
deja vu. He's back right where he was. But this time, he decides to obey God, to walk with God. See, it doesn't matter how much you've blown it or how long it's been. If you're willing to obey, God can use you. And so round one, round one, jo Jonah sets out for Tarshish. Round two, he's draped his camel with the sign, Nineveh or bust. And he takes off for Nineveh. And as he gets to Nineveh, he finds this massive city. I, I love one, a comment that I read this week, and, and this is a quote from another pastor. He says, I hope you realize that almost daily you're going to face a Nineveh in your life. You'll read something in scriptures, and you won't like it. You'll hear something from a preacher or a teacher, and it won't jive with you. God will call you to pick up something or lay something down, and you'll want to resist. What is this? It's your Nineveh. It's God's will and your decision of whether or not you're going to obey God's will or disobey it. But before you say no, remember this. Disobedience always brings always brings burdens. Obedience brings blessings. Disobedience always brings burdens, while obedience brings blessings. Now, let's be honest. Obedience is easy to speak about and hard to do. Is it not? Kids, how hard is it to be obedient when your parents ask you to do something? I promise it's a whole lot harder than it is for your parents to ask you to do it. Obedience is not always easy. Do you remember what was going on in this story? God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. You remember who the Ninevites were? They were vicious, immoral, pagan people. They, they, were, they were just vicious. It said, history books say that they, just, just because they didn't like it, they'd kill you. That they were known for their violence. There's actual, there's actual sightings of where they would take people and peel the skin off them just for fun. These were not a good people. If there was ever a time to say, you know what, God, I'd rather not do this because I'm fearful for my life or because these people deserve what they get. Jonah had that place. He had that opportunity. But this time, instead of saying, you know what, God, I'm going to let my fear or I'm going to let my sense of justice overwhelm me, he says, no, nope, God, I will be obedient. I will go where you've asked me to go. And so verse 4 he says, on the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. Now, Nineveh, it wasn't a small town. It's believed that a man could travel by foot somewhere between 12 and 15 miles a day. So you do the math. It was a three-day walk from one side of Nineveh to the other. That would be about the distance from here to downtown Atlanta. That's a big place. And it was estimated there were 600,000 people. We know from chapter 4 that it released 120,000 children. So 480,000 adults that he comes and he preaches this word to. And, you know, I could just imagine he walks into the city and he probably looks and goes, holy cow. God, you want me to deliver a message to this? Where do I begin? Where do I begin? I mean, did he put one of those little sandwiches boards, sandwich boards on him, start walking around and says, repent, the kingdom of God is at hand? Did, he didn't have a bullhorn. And so he starts walking through the town and he starts proclaiming this eight-word sermon. Forty days. Forty days to repent or God is going to destroy you. Forty days. I got to tell you, I'm pretty proud of Jonah he didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't soft pedal it. He didn't hire a PR firm to go and do marketing research about how he should do this. He just began walking and doing, proclaiming what he said. Now, from a human perspective, this had to look crazy. How many of you have ever been to a big city where you've seen somebody on the street with a bullhorn screaming out, repent, repent, you're going to hell, turn to burn? I've seen it. I was driving through Jonesboro the other day, and there was a woman doing it. I was in Noonan a couple of weeks ago, and there was a guy standing on the corner in Noonan doing it. I don't know about you guys, but when I see that, there's this sense of, oh, this doesn't feel right for me. And so Jonah is going through this time. It makes no human sense other than the fact that Jonah was being obedient. 
Jonah was doing what God called him to do. And I love this because Jonah agreed to do his job, and that was to obey. And he said, you know what? I'm going to do my job, and I'm going to leave the results to God. Folks, that's all we can do. Can you convict people of their sin? Anybody? This means no. This means yes. This means I don't know. All right? Can you convict people of their sin? No. Can, can, can you condemn people for their sin? You can, but it doesn't work. We can't convict people. We can't, can you convince them? No. You can't convert them. All this is a work of God. And so our job, when God tells us, when God calls us, we're called to convey the message, and we're called to convey the message the way God wants it conveyed. In fact, don't miss that. He says, back earlier, he says, and he did what God told him to do. He didn't go and carry his message. The world doesn't need your opinion. The world doesn't need my opinion. The world needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it needs put, we need to present it and package it, not from a humanistic point of view, but from a divine biblical point of view so they get the real scripture and don't get our Baptist version of it. It's the power of God. It's the presence of God. It's the work of God that changes lives, not our presentation of it. And so jo Jonah goes and delivers it. And here's this amazing point to me. Faith never rests in the messenger, but rather in the God who gives the message. The power of salvation is in the gospel of Christ. It's not in me. I'm simply the messenger who delivers it. And that's what he does. He obeys. He simply obeys. I love the story of a man named Sir Leonard Wood. I think he got this. He was introduced to the king of France, and the king of France offered an invitation for him to come and to dine at his table. They kind of hit it off. And so they get to get, the, the, he gets the invitation and instead of RSVPing, he just shows up at the, at, at the castle. And they, the king comes out and says, um, Sir Leonard, why are you here? He goes, well, you sent an invitation. You asked me to come and have dinner. He goes, yeah, but you didn't send back notice. And his response is great. I love what he says to them. He says, my king, my majesty, a king's invitation doesn't need to be answered. It simply needs to be obeyed. Folks, when God calls to us, it doesn't matter where we've been, what we've done. When God calls to us, our response is to be obedient. And that's what we see in Jonah. He's obedient. As a result of his obedience, God, remember, God calls him, he responds, he's obedient, and the result was Nineveh repents. Nineveh changes. I want you to listen to this again. The Ninevites believed God. They believed Yahweh. They declared a fast in all of them, from the greatest to the least, from the king to the guy who cleans the toilets, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. He issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let any man or animal, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. So he called a fast. But let man and beast, man and animal, be covered in sackcloth. Can you imagine? Everything was covered in sackcloth. Everything was covered as an act of of humbling uh, of humility and of, and of a seeking of grace of, of grace of God. And he says, let everyone call urgently on God. Let everyone pray. Let everyone beg for mercy. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. You know, I cannot help but to think about Second Chronicles, if my people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will come and heal their land. Right here, the pagans pray the very prayer that God asked the Israelites to pray. And every one of them cry out. And then I love this. 
And we pray that God may yet relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. What you have just read, what you have just witnessed is the greatest ministry miracle in all of human history. At least 480,000 people transformed. What are the odds? What are the odds? What are the odds of Jonah actually coming back to God and saying, okay, I'll go? What are the odds that when he got there that he would deliver, get a look at this, an eight-word sermon? Have you ever heard of anyone changing because of an eight-word sermon? Some of you right now going, I wish you only had eight words. An eight-word sermon. What are the odds that 480,000, maybe 600,000 people that quickly turned their lives to God? What are the odds? It reminds me of a cute story I heard about this teacher. She came in and, and she wanted to teach her little six-year-olds how to spell. And she says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get, get, think about what your dad does for a living. I want you to announce it and then spell it. And so the little Mary goes, I want to go first. She goes, okay, Mary. Mary comes up and she goes, my dad's a baker, B-A-K-E-R. And if he were here today, he'd give everyone a cookie. And they're like, mmm, cookie. Then little, little Timmy got up and goes, my dad is a banker, B-A-N-K-E-R. And if he were here today, he would give everyone a dollar. Like, hey, that's better. Well, little Johnny gets up says, my dad's an ophthalmologist. Poor little boy. He tried to start spelling it. They all sat. The kids were like going, oh, please, someone save him. Someone rescue him. And finally the teacher says, Johnny, I'll tell you what. Why don't you sit down, and we'll try to figure this out. He goes, Who wants to go next? And this little kid named Sam raises his hand, and Sam goes, I'll go next. My dad's a bookie, B-O-O-K-I-E. And if he were here today, he'd give eight to five odds. Johnny's never going to spell ophthalmologist. <laughs> I don't know what the odds were, but humanly speaking, the odds weren't great. But here's the point. This is so amazing. With God, all bets are off. When God gets engaged in something, God changes everything. And that's the reason 600,000 people can that quickly come to faith in God is because God can change any man's heart. Now, what most of us don't know, what you may be unaware of, is that God was working behind the scenes before Jonah ever arrived. See, it was said that within five years of Jonah's arrival, one, there had been an incredible eclipse, solar eclipse, and then second, there was a famine in the land. Both of those were considered bad omens according to Assyrian uh, the Syrian thought of life. And so they were already kind of going, mm, what's going on here? Then you have the fact that Jonah, because he came out of the belly well, most believed that he had actually changed colors, that his skin, his pigmentation his skin had lightened up. And so they had the, the story, and all of a sudden Jonah shows up, and they're like going, whoa, wait a second. This guy's a little different. And then you have the fact that three, three, nations, three tribes north of Nineveh were coming together and they were threatening to attack the Ninevites. And then the last thing that we know from history is that there had been two plagues within five years of, of, of Jonah's arrival where thousands of people had died. What does that mean? It, it shows us how God was working behind the scenes to prepare the very moment that Jonah showed up to deliver the message of hope. Folks, listen very carefully. If God has called you to go somewhere, to say something, to speak into someone's life, and you're under the inspiration, the lean of the Holy Spirit of God, you can be certain that he is already working behind the scenes to prepare your arrival and your message. The key for all of us is simply to be obedient. I love it when I, have, when I, when I engage someone and someone will go, how did you know? Or they'll share with me, you know, this thing was happening, this was happening, this was happening, and now you're here. How did it happen this way? 
Because God in his sovereignty, God in his omnipotence, God in his omniscience, God in his omnipresence, because he loves and cares, not just for the Israelite, but also for the Ninevite, not just for the saved man, but also for the lost man. He is working right in front of us, behind the scenes, because he loves the whole world so much that he gave his son that every single one of us can come into a relationship with him. I love what the Bible, what, the Peter, what first Peter says, God wishes no one would perish, but all would come to repentance. God is constantly at work, constantly at work, wanting to move in such a way as to change hearts, to soften us, to prepare us. There's another thing I want you to see right here in this text, and that's Nineveh's repentance. You remember last week how we talked about repentance? Repentance isn't just saying, realizing your situation and saying, hey, I've blown it, my situation's the way it is, God, will you forgive me? And then you kind of go in your business. That true biblical repentance, according to the story of prodigal son, is that I realize my rebellion, I see the results, I come to God, I ask God to forgive me, and then I go make restitution with my fellow man who my sin has infected, and then I also face the consequences, the retribution. And it's only when I've gone through that process that reconciliation and restoration can take place. Notice the Ninevites, they're modeling true biblical repentance. See, there is no belief without corresponding action. They make restitution. They face retribution. It, it, it says that they cover themselves. The whole nation, they cover themselves. They cry out to God. Their actions show that they're truly repentant. Now, there's a powerful message for all of us. Number one, let's think about when someone has done something and their, their, their activity has offended us, hurt us, and they come and say, oh, I'm sorry. Are they saying, I'm sorry, just so that you can let them off the hook? Or are they saying, I'm sorry, because it's, it's what we have casually done, but really we're not sorry? The only way you can tell if someone is truly repentant is by their actions. The truth also holds for us. The way that we can know that we're truly repentant is that our actions match up with our words. And we see in this passage that these guys, their actions actually have changed. Their, their activity says we are truly seeking, desiring God. There's a story during the 19th century about the Welch Revivals. The Welch Revival is one of the greatest revivals in, in all of history. It said that there were so many families, so many men coming to God that it, it literally revolutionized an entire nation. In particular, there was a problem because down at the docks where all these people were, were, were changing their life, they started bringing back all the things they had stolen from the shipyards. They were bringing back wheelbarrows and hammers and saws and, and different types of equipment. And it got to be such a problem because there were just piles of stuff that had been stolen that the people were returning that finally the, the, the leadership came and they, they, they sent out this message. They put up this sign, and I love it. It says, if you have been led by God to return what you have stolen, the management forgives you and wishes you, wishes you would keep it because we don't have room for it. What happened? God really was working in their hearts and their actions met up with what was going on. That's repentance. And I love it. So we see that God calls. God repeats the call. Jonah responds to the call. The, it, the Ninevites, they repent according to this call. And then finally, God mercifully relents. God relents. Verses 1 to 4, we saw God res Jonah respond. Verses 5 to 9, we see that Nineveh responds. But now, we're seeing God respond. And listen to the way God responds. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. God had compassion. It's kind, of, it's kind of nice to know that everybody's back where they belong. Jonah's back right with God because he's been obedient. The Ninevites are back right with God because they're repentant. And God's back where he wants to be. And that is dispensing grace, giving forgiveness, sharing his love with others. Listen, there's a, there's a powerful lesson we get from Jonah here. 
and that is obedience. And it was Jonah's obedience that set things into motion. Obedience always sets off a chain reaction resulting in the blessings of God. Because Jonah obeyed, Nineveh obeyed, and God was able to give mercy. We cannot minimize our obedience. Our obedience is a step of faith. Our obedience is saying, God, we trust you. We believe you. We're going to leave the results to you. But God, we believe you. I love this statement. Someone put it this way. To know God is to love God. To love God is to trust God. To trust God is to obey God. And to obey God is to be blessed by God. See, all the misery that Jonah went through is because he said no to God when he should have said yes. All the calamity the Ninevites experienced was because they said no to God instead of saying yes to God. It makes me wonder. How many lives, how many opportunities have I missed because I said no to God when he wanted me to say yes? How many people did I miss the opportunity to see come to know, come to know Christ in faith because I said no? How many times did God call me to go on a mission trip and I came up with every reason why I couldn't instead of trusting him so that I could? I wonder. Listen to this statement. No matter what you've done, where you've been, how stubborn you've been toward God, your life can still make an eternal and earthly difference. If you choose today to start living in obedience with his will and his word. That's the key. See, God's not finished with you. He wants to use your life, but you've got to be willing to obey the call. That's what we learned. If we don't learn anything from Jonah chapter 3, is that God can perform the most crazy of miracles if we'll just say, Lord, here I am. Send me. Lord, here's my life. Here's my talents. Here's my abilities. I'm not going to hold anything back. It's all yours. If it doesn't make any earthly sense, that's okay. If you're going to put me in, in a very difficult situation for your glory, that's okay. I will go wherever you want me to go, do what you want me to do, say what you want me to say. I will be obedient, and I will leave the results to you. I think that's what we can learn from chapter 3. And all this is based in the amazing love and grace of God. I love the story. I heard a story recently about Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon is one of the greatest preachers in the history, in modern history. He was one day walking across the English countryside, and as he was walking with a friend, he looks up and he sees this strange sight. He sees a weather vane that on the side of it, it just said, God is love. And he looked at his friend, and he says, you know, I have a problem with that. Th that doesn't make sense to me. And, and he said, weather vanes are changeable, but God's love is constant. So I don't agree with that. And to which his friend responded very quickly. He says, Charles, you're wrong here. You're looking at this all wrong. If you look at this closely, what you'll see is that sign is indicating an amazing truth that regardless of which way the wind blows, God is always love. God is always there. God is always present. That he is faithful even when we're faithless. You know, as I think about that, and I think about our lives, and I think about how sometimes that we can be like Jonah, it doesn't change who God is. It doesn't change the call of God. It doesn't change, really, our responsibility as followers of Christ. That God wants to use our life, that we are his hands, we are his feet, we are his voice. And that if we will simply say, God, I know that you love me, but I also know that you love every single person around me. That you can have my life and I'm going to be obedient so that my life makes an eternal difference today.